After God proclaimed his judgment on Israel, Judah, and the nations around them through Amos, he reminded Israel of who he was. Remember, Amos is speaking the word of the Lord to the nation of Israel at Bethel, the location of the golden calf. The golden calf set up by Jeroboam was not the God who brought them out of Egypt and into the promised land. Amos 2, 9 and 10. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was as strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also it was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt, and led you forty years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. As the God who did bring them out of Egypt and into the promised land, God established his sovereignty over them. He outlines how they have gone away from him and the punishment that will result because they strayed. He concludes this section by enumerating all that he had done to convince Israel to return to him and Israel's response to each of those attempts. I'm Brenda Cathcart, and this is the Voice of the Prophets. God honored Israel by calling both prophets and Nazarites from among them to serve him. Instead of treating these messengers and set-apart Nazarites with the honor and respect due to them, Israel mocked them. Amos 2, 11 and 12. I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is it not so, O you children of Israel, says the Lord? But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. One of the conditions of the Nazarite is that he or she would not drink wine during the period of time they were set apart to God. Instead of respecting this, Israel tried to destroy the vow by offering or even forcing the Nazarite to drink wine. As for the prophet, they didn't like the words that the prophet spoke and commanded them to stop prophesying. Because Israel dishonored God's servants, they dishonored God. Amos 2.13 Behold, I am weighed down by you, as a cart full of sheaves is weighed down. The laden cart is a powerful metaphor for the weight of the burden that the sins of Israel had on God. It is appropriate that Amos bring this word to Israel. Amos's name, number 5986 in Strong's Concordance, means burdensome, such as that loaded on a cart. Because of the weight of their sins on God, Israel would in turn be weighed down. They will not be able to escape the consequences of their sins. Amos 2, 14-16 Therefore flight shall perish from the swift. The strong shall not strengthen his power, nor shall the mighty deliver himself. He shall not stand who handles the bow. The swift of foot shall not escape, nor shall he who rides a horse deliver himself. The most courageous men of might shall flee naked in that day, says the Lord. God says that because of the special relationship he has with Israel, he will punish them for their iniquities. Amos 3, 1 and 2. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. The word punish is from the Hebrew word pakad, number 6485, meaning to visit. In this case, God visits Israel for punishment and not for good. God asks a series of nine rhetorical questions whose answers are obvious and certain to illustrate both the inevitability and righteousness of God's judgment. The number nine represents judgment. The plagues God sent on Egypt included nine plagues which did not directly result in the death of the people. After each plague, Egypt had the opportunity to repent. However, after the ninth plague, Egypt still did not repent. Judgment was set. The tenth plague carried out the judgment. The first five rhetorical questions that God asked demand an answer of no, especially the first question about two people walking together. Amos 3, 3 through 5. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? 
Will a young lion cry out of his den if he has caught nothing? Will a bird fall into a snare on the earth where there is no trap for it? Will a snare spring up from the earth if it has caught nothing at all? The critical question is the first question whose answer is no. Two cannot walk together unless they agree. The next two questions demand an answer of yes. Amos 3, 6. If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? The critical question in its answer is that the Lord is the one who brings calamity on a city. At this point, Hosea emphasizes the correct answer that God brings calamity on a city while reminding them that the calamity did not occur without a warning from the prophets. Amos 3, 7 Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. The last two questions elaborate on this theme of a warning before calamity strikes. Amos 3, 8 A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? This verse exhibits the Hebrew structure of parallelism. The statement, a lion has roared, is paired with the statement, the Lord God has spoken. God is the roar of the lion. Again, the lion represents God's righteous judgment. All those who hear the roar of the lion will fear. The prophets that Israel had commanded not to prophesy must prophesy. The words of these prophecies follow. God calls on Egypt and Ashdod of the Philistines to witness the iniquity of Israel. Amos 3, 9 and 10. Proclaim in the palaces at Ashdod and in the palaces in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble on the mountains of Samaria. See great tumults in her midst and the oppressed within her, for they do not know how to do right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. The sentence for their iniquities is that they will be surrounded, defeated, and exiled. Amos 3, 11 and 12. So the Lord Jehovah says this, An enemy, he shall be all around the land, and he shall bring you down from your strength, and your palaces shall be plundered. So says the Lord, as the shepherd takes two legs out of the mouth of the lion, or a piece of an ear, so shall the sons of Israel be taken out, those who dwell in Samaria, in the corner of a bed, and in Damascus on a couch. Even those who live in luxury in the capital cities of Samaria and Damascus, who recline on a couch or a bed, will be taken into exile. Neither their altars in Bethel nor their wealth represented by their multitude of dwelling places will deliver them from the coming judgment. Amos 3, 13 through 15. Hear and testify in the house of Jacob, says the Lord Jehovah, the God of hosts. For in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel on him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel. And the horns of the altar shall be cut off and shall fall to the ground. And I will strike the winter house together with the summer house. And the houses of ivory shall perish. And the great houses shall be swept away, says the Lord. Amos calls those who inhabit those luxurious houses as cows of Bashan. Amos 4.1 Hear this word, cows of Bashan, who are in the mountain of Samaria, who press down the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their masters, Bring in, that we may drink. Bashan is a fertile region east of the Jordan River that the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh claimed for their own because of the excellent grazing land. The cows who fed on this land would have been sleek and fat. The cows of Samaria symbolize the wives of the nobles who fed off the poor, demanding more and more. Amos declared that these women who were living in the capital city of Samaria would be dragged out of the city through the broken walls and not through the gates. Amos 4, 2 and 3. The Lord Jehovah has sworn by his holiness that the day shall come on you that he will lift you up with meat hooks and your sons with fish hooks and you shall go out at the breaches, each woman straight before her and you shall cast down the high place, says the Lord. 
Amos, speaking from Bethel, sarcastically calls them to worship at Bethel in Gilgal, as if their offerings could make up for the way they oppressed the poor. Amos 4, 4 and 5. Come to Bethel and transgress to Gilgal and multiply transgressing at Gilgal and bring your sacrifices for the morning, your tithes for three years, and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving from that which is leavened, and cry out, call out the voluntary offerings, for so you love to do, O sons of Israel, says the Lord Jehovah. They loved the outward signs of worship while they transgressed the Torah in their daily lives, particularly in how they stole even the little that the poor had in order that they could live in decadence. What could God do to get the attention of Israel? He sent prophets, but Israel told them not to prophesy. God called Nazarites, but they corrupted them with wine. When Israel would not listen to God's prophets, he turned to sending them calamity to demonstrate that it was not their idols who had blessed them, but God. Amos lists five calamities that God laid upon Israel. Five is the number of grace or redemption. For example, there are five books of Torah and five different types of offerings. How do we see grace or redemption in calamities? Amos explains as he lists each calamity. The first calamity is famine, Amos 4, 6. Also, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in your places, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. God's goal in sending famine was that the children of Israel would return to him. When that didn't work, God sent a drought, Amos 4, 7 and 8. I also withheld rain from you when there were still three months to the harvest. I made it rain on one city, I withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon, and where it did not rain, the part withered. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Even the drought did not inspire Israel to return to God. When the drought didn't work, God sent crop failure. Amos 4, 9. I blasted you with blight and mildew. When your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, and your olive trees, the locusts devoured them. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Each of these calamities was reminiscent of the plagues in Egypt. The calamities continued to grow in intensity and severity. The next calamity was defeat in war. The number of dead caused a stench in their camps. Amos 4.10 I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I killed with a sword along with your captive horses. I made the stench of your camps come up into your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. But still, Israel did not return to God. Finally, God stated that he allowed the cities to burn in the manner of Sodom. Amos 4.11 I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. In spite of all this, Israel refused to return to God. We see the possibility of grace and redemption in these five calamities because God's desire was that they return to him. If they had returned, God would have forgiven them and accepted them once more as his people. Jeremiah will later speak the same words to Judah. Jeremiah thirty-five fifteen. I have also sent to you all my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Turn now everyone from his evil way. Amend your doings and do not go after other gods to serve them. Then you will dwell in the land which I have given you and your fathers. But you have not inclined your ear nor obeyed me. These five calamities that God caused to fall on Israel did not turn the hearts of Israel back to God. As a result, punishment was inevitable. You'd think that these five calamities were punishment, and in a sense they were. However, their ultimate purpose was to convince Israel that they needed to turn back to God.
In contrast, the first nine plagues on Egypt were a precursor of certain judgment against the gods of Egypt. The tenth plague was the realization of that judgment, the death of the firstborn of Pharaoh on all the firstborn of Egypt. By rejecting God's call to repentance through the five calamities, Israel was about to meet their God. Amos 4, 12 and 13. Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind, who declares to man what his thought is, and makes the morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. In the book of Revelation, John writes about seven seals. Five of those seals release calamities on earth, including war, conquest, conflict, famine, disease, crop failure, and disturbances in the heavens. At the end of these calamities, the kings of the earth, like Israel, refuse to turn to God. Revelation 6, 15 and 16. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The righteous who testify to the goodness of God and proclaim the message of repentance to receive salvation will be killed for their testimony, just like Israel killed the prophets God sent them. Revelation 6, 9 and 10. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Because the kings of the earth will not repent, they will meet the living God. Revelation 6:17. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? God's desire is that people repent for their iniquities. In Israel, God sent the prophets, but they refused to hear. He sent Nazarites as an example, and they tempted them with wine. He sent calamities, and they refused to repent. At that point, God did send judgment on Israel. As the day of the Lord approaches, God still desires that mankind will return to him. He will send prophets and Nazarites. When that doesn't work, he will send calamities. When that doesn't work, the day of God's wrath will come on the earth. If you do not have a relationship with God the Father through Yeshua the Son, now is the time to repent and ask God for his mercy. Yeshua paid the price for your iniquities. Accept that his death paid the penalty for your sins and that his resurrection brings new life to those who believe. Then live the life that God wants you to live. Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I'm Brenda Cathcart for Moed Ministries International. Shalom and be blessed.